Say I think. Thank you, I meant to. This is a hastily constructed dialogue. Therefore, if there are any reasons to complain, yell at Nancy. Is that fair? <laughs> with my deepest <clears throat> Do you have one? I don't. Uh, you? Yes. She's not there. Yeah. She will be. Oh, she will be? Okay. <laughs> Did you hear what's happening in Paris and no. in all over France? No. They're having this thing called Nuit Debout, which means oh, the night standing. 71. And people are gathering to talk about everything. Not only in Paris, but people are just coming together and talking in these big groups and like they have hand signals to signify agreement or disagreement about economy, politics, whatever, en masse. Huge numbers. What's going on? Don't know. I mean, hey, that means there's a change. Yeah. Mm. Say, Barbara has an interesting announcement. I do? Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, have you heard about the, the people called the Nuit Debout protesters that occupy France, French cities in a revolutionary call for change? Yeah. Nuit Debout means night standing, right? Or up front. And it says, thousand, as night fell over Paris, thousands of people sat cross legged in the vast square at Place de la République taking turns to pass around the microphone and denounce everything from the dominance of Google to tax evasion or inequality on housing estates. The, debating the, the whole country is talking about the need for change. <laughs> right. Conversation. The debating continued into the early hours of the morning with soup and sandwiches, blah, blah, blah. Isn't that cool? Yes. Yeah, all right. We vote. Oh, God. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Okay, this is where we're going. What can we learn <clears throat> about analogy when we consider that they may function <clears throat> <clears throat> from a higher, more significant dimension than our three-dimensional world. <clears throat> All right? So therefore, that presupposes we have a model, right? Presupposes we must have a model of how to assume the impact of the fourth upon the third. 
That's what it assumes. How, how, how are we to tell or to discover or to talk about the possibility that an, the impact of the fourth dimension upon the third dimension is nothing other than the function of analogies? Right. Okay. Yeah, could you put that up on the lintel so we can read it? You know, like stick it up on the... It has no back cover. Ah, no sticky? Did you mean up there? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, wait, can you put it over on the fireplace? Where do you want it? Over the fireplace. Over the fireplace. You know, like right in the middle. Put it on the TV. Put it on the ceiling. Oh, Any from the for everyone to spectate. Thank you. Okay, look. There are living things that can be said to be in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and maybe 4th dimension. Let's talk about the simplest living things that only have one, one cognitive function, sensation. Right? What does that mean? That means anything that impacts them from other kinds of living beings that have a two-dimensional worldview can feed upon the first dimension with freedom and the first dimensional people will also, or beings, will always find it mysterious that they are being attacked in a strange and unknown way. So let me put that in terms of a couple of ideas. Number one, if sensation can be regarded as a point moving in a direction not contained in itself, So that anything then that is a two-dimensional will have a particular advantage over all one-dimensional because the one-dimensionals will never be able to conceive, think, imagine the presence of any two-dimensional functioning with or against them. What does that mean? How does, how does a one-dimensional thing become a two-dimensional? Same principle. Any motion that is not contained in itself but moving in an unknown and extra dimension always adds to itself another dimension. What does that mean? Therefore, if you have a line and it now moves in a direction not contained in itself, you would be creating a two-dimensional figure called a surface. Therefore, a two-dimensional thing can be said to have perception as well as sensation. All living things that have perception and sensation but not concepts, they can be taken advantage all the time because they never can expect the higher dimension, we, the three-dimensional beings, how we can possibly overtake them, trap them, manipulate them, because we're coming from a, a different higher dimension. And look here, if you have a surface, you can continue that surface in any of those two directions and you stay in the same world, the world of perception. But what would it mean for something to move from a two to a third dimension, see? 
That means it must move in a direction not contained in either of these, but in an unknown direction. That's a concept, concepts, ideas. Now, in each one of these cases, we can say that the preceding, the preceding dimension is always a movement in unknown direction to itself, but it can capitalize on those less than itself or going upward or downward, the same logic. So how can we picture a fourth dimension? And what would that be and how is it related to analysis? Huh, so look here. Let us assume, let us assume that we can rotate this object in an unknown direction not contained in itself. Well, you have to have a point of origin of each one of these. And that term, that beginning point is necessary at each of these three dimensions. Starting, starting, starting. Now, we can capture that by saying, what if we move this in a direction not contained in itself by rotating each one of the sides through 180 degrees? What would we have? Well, if we take A, B, C, D, this side, and rotate it 180 degrees, we would be Moving in in this direction, wouldn't we? Uh, by the way, in the same way, if we wanted to, if we wanted to uh, move the top 180 degrees, we would then have, and by the same logic, the bottom could equally be rotated 180 degrees. So you know what this would be? Look what this would be. B, D, right? A, B. Well, you know what that is? Look here. Let me, let me show you what this is. We're rotating this through itself. Now, what does that mean? When we rotate it, we produce symmetry. The fourth dimension in the three-dimensional world is the property of symmetry. Now look here, All, everything in nature shows symmetry. Every leaf, every flower, everything, anything you look at living has its own uh, uh, symmetry. Symmetry, therefore, is the mark of the fourth dimension. Now, that's the case, what kind of order is this? Symmetry, balance, see? Balance, uh, harmony, uh, higher order,
all of those qualities, therefore, can be inferred from the movement from a, from a four to a three dimension. Therefore, all, all nature is exhibiting the property of the fourth dimension that we perceive in a three dimension in respect to harmony, sound, balance, higher orders. Now, look, let's, let's take a look at this. Now, what does this mean for us? Um, the fourth dimension, therefore, is a movement from sensation to perception to concepts to intuition. So if I were to construct a simple analogy such as uh, <clears throat> uh, a captain is to his crew as a doctor, a physician is to his patients You know what that means? That means you have to tell me why this is a possible, meaningful analogy. Tell me, what does it presuppose for a man to become a captain, and what does it presuppose for a crew to be members of a crew? Can anyone be a captain? Can anyone be a physician? Does this analogy on both sides presuppose a certain kind of knowledge? If so, then the captain has that knowledge, and because of that knowledge he possesses and the others do not, the crew has to believe that he has that knowledge. They don't know that he has it. They believe he has it, and so they follow his directions. By the way, is the same thing true here? Oh, wait a minute. Must a physician to be a physician have a certain kind of knowledge? Yeah. Do patients become patients because they like the physician, or because they think he has a knowledge that may benefit them? Obviously, they're only going to go. Matter of fact, they're put in a rather peculiar situation that whatever the physician requires may cause the patient more pain than they had before. But they're willing to subject themselves to that kind of misuse or treatment because I think in the end, in the short range, they're going to be better off than they were in the long range. So therefore, there's an important kind of knowledge and time that comes together. Because what good is a doctor who understands all aspects of medicine, but he has no sense of time? Then he couldn't tell you if you do this for so long, this might happen and this might happen if you don't. It's always knowledge and time for benefit. But wait a minute. As you look at this, can you also say one of them has a higher degree of this knowledge than the other? Yes or no? Yes. Which one? The physician. Physician, therefore, we can arrange this in two ways. We can put this first and put this second. And in that respect, we are then positioning them in a hierarchy. Oh. Say, wait a minute. Is it likely that a ruler is to his subjects? As a physician is to his patients? If so, what can you draw? Can you not draw a conclusion that he too must have a knowledge In about theory. how to benefit his subjects? Yes. And if he doesn't, he may have the title, but he shouldn't have the role. Agree. Right? Ah, 
So which one would you say has a greater knowledge? In my experience, I don't know of any rulers. <laughs> that. That's why now watch, we have to go ideal. Oh, okay. Then the ruler should have. Then the ruler should have the kind of knowledge which can, when applied to the subjects, Benefit can them. make them better. Therefore, that should be the state of, see, that should be the state of union message by the presidents. Mm -hmm. That is a diagnosis, see? Then the ruler makes a diagnosis of his subjects or, or his nation and offers a therapy called a treatment, right? Therefore, in the state of the union message, he's making an analysis and offering a remedy for all the difficulties in his state that will help all of his subjects gain a higher degree of freedom and interest and, and value in their lives. Agree? Ah, then wait a minute. But wait a minute. What's common among these? Uh, Benefit. What? What? Benefit. Sure, right? There must be a benefit. Let me suggest something, okay? All of these and others that we can apply all fit under one name. They are masters. They are masters that all must have a certain kind of knowledge. Therefore, they're knowledge masters. Masters that presupposes, watch, we'll change the word, mastership. When we add ship to a word in English, that, that means they possess an art. And the higher sense of art, and that is that it can bring benefits to subjects. when the kind of knowledge they have, therefore, is directed to benefit them, then they have an art. Well then, this whole class of analogies fits under the class of mastership. Oh, oh by the way, uh, finish this one for me. God is to his creation, fits into these, see? When we pair these, those are called, see? Those are called ratios. So an analogy is a contrast between any pair, a pair of ratios. If that's true, say, uh, would you put this one higher than all of the other three? All right. Then take four. Four is two. One, two, three. Uh, I'd say three. Three. Okay, try it. If God is to his creation as a ruler is to his subjects, then what will you say about God? Yeah. Yeah. and he can, that he has oversight over all. Oh, can you now also take features of this and add it to? Uh, I guess, uh, if God is his creation, would he be like a physician to his patients? I could the image of God by doing that. Yeah. Then he must seek to? Benefit each one of the subjects with a certain kind of knowledge. Oh! Notice, we're not dealing with belief. We're just saying, if.
By the way, now that you're pretty good at theology, <laughs> right, right? We're taking a class in theology based upon analogy. analogy. By the way, would you say God must be a master? Must he not have a mastership? Yeah, let's get it. Must he not have, therefore, a clear design in his mind of how to bring about the best for his entire creation? Absolutely. Oh, oh. And in doing its best, therefore, it must bring about things that are both beautiful and good in the end. And in each moment, it should be fulfilling its desire. Exactly. Oh, oh. Right. Well, then, look here. This is rather curious. Um, I'll use this tomorrow. If we decide to take a look at an analogy, there are four kinds of mean analogies, right? There's arithmetic, geometric, harmonic, and golden sections. They are all mean analogies, which means the two middle terms must be the same. So you have extremes and two common terms right, in order to create a mean analogy, such as a is to B as B is to C. Well, whenever you're dealing with an analogy, there are two rules that you have for switching them. And let's just, for a few moments, just hit a couple of them. Uh, Now, with analogies, you can use terms or ideas, symbols, lines, numbers. So anytime you're playing with analogy, you can then go back and put in ideas or terms you can put in symbols, or you can say this line is to this line as this line is to that line. Or numbers, we can say two is to four as four is to eight. But look here, notice, would you agree that you can also say uh, four is to two as uh, 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 as eight is to four. Or you can say B is to A as C is to B. B. Ah, oh, pardon me. Woo, 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 woo. What did I do? I just switched it around. Uh, 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 you just switched it to B, B, C, B. Right four. Uh, C, B. Okay. Now, you can also, in analogies, take the terms alternately. Either way. So you can also have B is to C, as A is to D, and you can switch them just as you did before. So, these are the four possible transformations of analogy, four term mean analogies. So I have, I took that and I put it here. By the way, if we apply that principle that we did a moment ago of a fourth dimensional movement in a three dimensional world, then we would have to have a movement where this
And by the way, wouldn't we also, we can also do it, it can go this way as well. Turn it inside out. Or we can do it this way, or this way. Think about it. Are those possible transformations? What's significant about that? Now I did it for you, right? But look here. You find something curious? Would you say that the order, okay, let's call this one, two, three, four, five. Would you agree that the order of two is the same as the order of four? CBBA, CBBA, BCB to BBCBA. Oh, by the way, uh, wait a minute. Is that equally true this way? If this gets pulled through that, well then, would it then, well, would it be the same? What do you think? Well, I, I can't quite see it apparently. Well, come on up and take a look, come on. <laughs> I see it. This is a CBCA. CBCA. That's different than this. Well, that's because I goofed. Oh. Uh, because that should be a B. A B. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your help. Okay. Then, then what will we say? Okay, but then BCAB is. BCAB, is right there. AB. AC. Right. Okay. Right? See how helpful you are? <laughs> well, then this is B, A, and C, B, and that's different. Well, then we can do the same, can we? Okay, so. <clears throat> Come on, there's another mistake in here. Come okay. On. Well, I mean, this is, these two are the same. Oh, okay, those two are the same. Those are the same. Okay, wait a minute. So that's. Okay, look here. Two equals three. Yeah. How about four and five? Okay, yeah, four and five are the same, yeah. Okay, and then... What's your, therefore, are uh, two and three and four and five the same? Yeah. But wait a minute, are they different than this? Yeah. Well, then there's only one valid form in all the transformations. Oh. Well, no, this is, the top is the same as, this is... Right. This is the same, but it's upside down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's only one legitimate form of it, and it's pure form. Right? Then it's transformed in the others, but they're all the same. Wait a minute. Would that be the same thing if we made, instead of a two-dimensional construction, a three-dimensional construction? Now, to have a three-dimensional construction, we need an order, we need a top. And a bottom. Hmm. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know. Well, that's rather going to be rather curious, isn't it? Yeah. Not yeah, curious. yeah. Hmm. Does that suggest that if we find something similar going on, that that there's only one valid form of it, and it's pure form, and it's pure expression. And the others are very, are common variations of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well then, wait a minute. Then if we're turning this inside out, mm -hmm. that's the very thing we were talking about a moment ago is a motion before it dimension. Ah! Yeah. Oh, well, what conclusion would you make? That it's going to get pretty complicated. But we should look for some simplicity. It'll be symmetrical. Yeah, but, oh yeah, higher degree that. of symmetry. But, oh. Okay, it'll be interesting. But I'll let you do the work. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little daunting. <laughs> I was just curious, how come you, you, you seem 
You've broken from the order of the four terminology that you have on the front of your book. Well, wait a while. A, B, three C. B, A, this is the... Uh, Shouldn't you have a ring of... This B's? is called the converse. This is called uh, taking them in the alternate form. And this is taking them conversely, and that's how you get those four. Is it the same order? Is, is it all relative, what you have on the front? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well, this is a three dimensional one on the. This one right here? Yeah, see. <laughs> Look here, see. Show him, remind him. Yeah, okay. hold it to that, watch. <coughs> Notice the diagonal. The diagonal. <laughs> Notice. But you need to change the D, Pierre. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, to a B. B, C, A, D. A, B, excuse me. My haste, right? So these are the same. These are the same. These inner are the internal. These are the extremities. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> these are the mean positions but they happen to be the extreme terms. And therefore, you have another interesting feature of this, which is quite remarkable. You have an inner unity if you connect all the Bs together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one that's on here. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, but that's, that's different than this one. Uh, it better not be. No, well, just tell me, is this a C right here? B, C, A, B. B, C, A, B. Excuse should me. should be a B, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good thing I'm working with people who have a good mind. Yeah. So this should be a B as well? Right, quite, quite correct. Well, you know, if you read a book for 20 years, <laughs> over and over again, it kind of... <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. So, let me... Let me. <laughs> so, are you saying that this <clears throat> symmetry is from a fourth dimension upon this three-dimensional space of the, uh, the, the analogy? So, the symmetry of the analogy imparts order upon... The, the terms, the ideas, the symbols, the lines, and the numbers? We're saying that when we look at what is going on, we can say it shows the property of symmetry, does it not? It also shows a higher degree of order, right? And you said it that shows that was the a harmony. Right, right. harmony, okay. right. balance. A balance, right? Look, this is balance, watch. First two terms, high position, low position. Balance, L high position, low position. The whole thing is symmetrical, balanced. Therefore, are these ideas, when we discover them in nature and our thinking, indication of fourth dimensional permeating our three dimensional world? If so, now we can play with analogies and Plato's Parmenides and see how we can use this to understand the everyday world, the philosophical and metaphysical world, and that's where we're going. Do, do you use a, when you were speaking earlier about the relationship of the second dimension with the first and the third with the second, yes. you use language like trapping them and manipulating them. Sure. Sensation is that, is that, is that, matched with. Is that true also for the fourth? Is yes. there an analogous relationship yes. to the fourth dimension? Yeah. How so? What do you mean, how so? How so does the fourth dimension trap and manipulate the third dimension? Would you agree that people who have interesting psychic abilities are functioning in a way totally unknown to our everyday thinking of what they're doing is true and real? Yes. It's fourth dimensional. 
Does it show balance, harmony, symmetry, etc.? Yeah. Does it show a higher kind of knowledge, which in our view is incredibly strange and unknown? Then it has all the marks of the fourth dimension. Therefore, see you tomorrow morning. See you tomorrow. Okay, this is where we're going. See you for Plato. Okay. okay. So, um, would it, is a cow a two-dimensional being? Or? Yes. Yes. No okay. concepts. And that's why sometimes when they get unusual animals that show higher intelligence, it baffles us that they could have it. Some horses, some dogs, cats have uncanny abilities that doesn't fit. That shows a, a possible growth that may be going on through an evolution since they're moving from a two to a three dimension. Aha, uh -huh, got a little picture, huh? Good for you.